Well, welcome once again to Word for the Week, our online book study series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. My name, my name is Jeremy Heikam. I'm the pastor of Cornerstone Faith Community Church, and I'm glad to be with you again this week as we um, look at chapter 10 of the book by Jerry Bridges called The Discipline of Grace. We're in chapter 10, um, where uh, Bridges has titled the chapter, The Discipline of Convictions. Now remember, last week um, in chapter 9, we talked about the discipline of commitment. What it takes to be committed to the Lord, committed to uh, His Word, committed to serving faithfully to Him. Um, this week we're going to talk about the discipline of our convictions. And Bridges starts uh, this chapter by talking about how um, oftentimes uh, folks will mention that you know in, in the 50s and the 60s and times before that, in the United States especially, there was sort of this um, moral agreement, I think is maybe how we would uh, talk about it, um, or a moral consensus, as Bridges calls it. The idea being, that doesn't mean that everybody agreed upon everything or that everybody agreed about all the different uh, things that were happening in the world even or, or that kind of thing but there was a there was a, a basic sense of moral obligation um, and there was a basic sense of where we turned to to find the, the sort of the foundation of that moral obligation and that basic sense of, uh, of where this moral obligation, moral foundation came from was seen most clearly in the Ten Commandments. And there was, by and large throughout the United States, there was, there was agreement on this. There was consensus on this. That's where we ran to sort of determine uh, the basis for morals. Well, obviously, we don't live in that world anymore. Many people challenge the Ten Commandments, challenge God's Word for sure. Um, and would suggest that, uh, well, maybe those are good things, but they're not necessarily the foundation of what we know to be moral, um, to be right, to be good. Uh, in the book on page 159, Bridges mentions uh, a study that was done by the Barna Research Group. He says, four out of ten people who call themselves evangelicals don't believe there is such a thing as an absolute truth according to this Barna Research Group poll. Um, I was just curious about when this poll was actually taken and how it was sort of uh, developed. And there's not a lot of information that I could find, but I did find this. That poll was taken in 1994. 1994. Here we are in 2020, so 16 years after the taking of that poll. And I would have to say um, that, that I'm, I'm still concerned about that, that, that ratio. Um, I don't know what the percentage of people are who claim to be evangelicals that would that would suggest there is no absolute truth. Um, but I'd like to believe that it's less than 40%, but uh, for some reason I don't think it is. And the reality of that is we live in this world where every day um, the media, um, radio, TV, I mean everything is just challenging. A society is challenging the idea of a moral consensus, a moral basis, um, and absolute truth as a whole. So we turn to page 160, and in about the middle of the page, Bridges says this. He says, it seems that in many evangelical circles we do have morality by consensus. We may not be doing what is right in our own eyes as society around us is doing. But neither are we living according to biblical standards. Instead, we live according to the standard of conduct of Christians that surround us. Um, that was a little bit confusing to me when I first read it, and so I went back and I reread it, I reread it, I reread it. I think this is what he's trying to say. We live in a society where there is this basic mentality that says, I'll do what's right for me, and you do what's right for you. And we aren't going to question one, one another upon what's right for me and what's right for you. Because I'm going to, even if we go to God's Word for a moment, folks are, are inclined to say, I'm going to interpret God's way, God's Word and God's will for me one way. You interpret it however you want to. I'm going to live 
the way that I want to live. You live the way that you want to live. And so we end up in this place where I think the only sort of socially correct thing or politically correct thing is to say, well, let's just agree to disagree on this topic. And while that's great compromise, the question that I always have when someone says, let's just agree to disagree is, well, why don't we agree to determine what scripture says for real? And then let's agree upon what scripture actually says. So when we say let's agree to disagree or, or I'll do what's right for me, you do what's right for you, the question is, does that agree with scripture or does scripture agree with that? We hear people saying um, things like this all the time. Um, oh, you should do business with Joe over there. You should buy a car from Joe or you should take your car to Joe to be fixed or you should have Joe the plumber come and uh, fix your, 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 um, your sink. Uh, and, and you'd say, oh, well, why is that? Well, Joe's a believer. Okay, well, just because Joe's a believer, does that mean that, um, well, does, what does that mean about his morals? I mean, it should tell us something about his morals, but the reality is we live in this world where there's this graying, this, this blurring of lines, and it's so hard for us to discern really truly what a, a person's moral compass is. Bridges goes on to talk about um, convictions, and he talks about how there are there are convictions that are good to hold, you know, things like honesty, for example. But then he also brings up the idea of, of there are some convictions that people hold that are just bad. It's it's bad to hold that conviction. I was thinking, well, what that might what might that kind of conviction be? And and the only thing that I could really kind of wrap my head around is if someone had the conviction that, for example, um, life is so stressful, and they believe that, you know, alcohol, alcohol is the thing that takes all the stress away from me. And so they're convinced that alcohol is the thing that does that for them. And so they rely on the alcohol to do that. That would be a bad, a bad kind of conviction. Interestingly enough, uh, in our world, no matter where we, where we look, I think, in our society, we're going to find that there is... Uh, this agree to disagree, I believe, you believe thing, and it boils down to this. There is God's word and what it says about our moral compass, our moral foundation. And there is what I'm going to say the world, society, everything other than God says. And those two things clash. They have always clashed. They will always clash. And by the way, they should always clash because when God the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, um, this was no surprise to him, but when Christ arrived here, uh, John tells us in chapter 1, uh, John chapter 1, that the world didn't receive him, wouldn't receive him, rejected him, pushed him away. And, and so, you know, it's it, that wasn't a surprise to God. Um, the reason he had to send his son here in the first place is because his people had so completely pushed away from him. And so the fact that they would reject his son, that's no, that's no big surprise. But that does tell us that there is always going to be this rub. There is always going to be this um, discord between God's word and what the world says. There's many other great comments that... Um, that uh, Bridges brings up in this in this book um, on page 163. I'm going to try to show this to you just as a reminder. But on page 163, I don't know if my camera is going to do this very well. There, you kind of get it. There is this line that um, Bridges uses, and he says it's basically a continuum. And so on this end of the continuum, we have what he's going to call sinful society, the world. And on this end of the continuum, he's going to have the word of God. And he says every conviction, every decision, every thought, every word, every deed falls somewhere on that continuum between sinful society and God's word. And what is helpful for us, especially when we're thinking about what drives us morally, what helps us to make moral decisions, what is right, what is wrong, how should I treat someone, is thinking about where that decision falls on this continuum between the sinful society and God's word. And so I think what I want to kind of just encourage you with today as we think about this idea of, you know, we if, if we're going to seek holiness in our life, if we're going to submit ourselves fully to God, if we are going to try to live um, in the righteous path that David talks about, 
um, you know, we have to have conviction. We have to have some pretty, pretty steep, uh, pretty, pretty strict moral conviction um, about the things that are right, that are wrong, and how we should treat one another. And um, I think Bridges argues for the development of what he's going to call biblical convictions. Not so much moral necessarily. Yes, they are morals, but they are biblical convictions. Con convictions. I um, mean, he outlines those in the rest of the chapter, but I, what I want to talk about is how would we actually develop that? How would we make those things um, a part of our life? And so um, these are things, by the way, that Bridges brings up. I'm just kind of going to kind of pull out uh, um, five key things, five key, five key ways I think that Bridges mentions that we can develop these biblical convictions. So here's the first one, through prayer. And I, I know you're probably like, oh, here we are back at prayer again. Everything, yeah, everything comes back to prayer. Without prayer, without conversation with God, how in the world could we ever know anything? And so, um, you know, I think it begins with prayer. We go to God and we say, listen, God, I want to be a person that people look at and they, and they say, he has good moral standing. He has good moral character. He, he's responsible, honest, trustworthy, all these other kind of things. But but I need you to help me find the basis for what is right, what is wrong, how I should interact with other people. So I think prayer is the great beginning for that. The, the next step sort of that Bridges brings up is this idea of, of, of developing a discipline within yourself to be in God's word every single day. Again, we're back to reading the Bible. Yes, we are. Because if we're not reading God's Word, if we're not spending time in God's Word, again, how will we ever know anything? And so we've got to discipline ourselves to spend that time every single day in God's Word in order that He can fill us, in order that He can show us and teach us these biblical convictions that we need. The, the next thing that I found in Bridges' work is um, this idea to call out to God, to cry out to Him. To ask him for understanding. Understanding of what? Well, I think first of all, understanding of how his word and his will is different from what this world would suggest. And then understanding about how to apply that to my life. How to live such a non-worldly life, uh, such a such a almost, I suppose, anti-worldly life, where, where we're against the things of this world and we're for the things of God where we have an understanding, a better understanding of what it is God would ask us, ask of us, and ask us to say to others, and do for others, and be for others. Um, the next, I think, step that Bridges pulls out is the idea of storing up God's Word, and we talked about this two weeks ago uh, in worship here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church as we talk about we're working through Psalm 119, and, and we started with this idea of hiding God's Word in our longing hearts, storing up God's Word for us. Bridges talks about it as treasuring it up. So in other words, you're, you're, you're filling up a treasure chest full of God's Word for you. To, to, to hide God's Word in your heart does not mean to, to, to sort of close uh, the Bible and say, that's that. okay, I read it, it's for me, I'm going to keep it for myself and put it on my shelf and never think of it again. It is um, not something that we, we put someplace so that we will forget it's there and not use it. To hide God's Word in our heart means to store it there, to treasure it there, to build it up and use it um, for, for our good as we live this life, but for the good of others as well, that they would come to know Him. And, and then the last piece that Bridges brings up in this chapter is leaving room for grace. The reality of moral convictions is we're trying to figure out what is right, what is wrong, and how should I treat other people. We are going to make mistakes from time to time when it comes to discerning what is right, what is wrong, and how we should treat other people. And while, no, it's not okay to choose the wrong thing or treat people wrongly, we, it, it, is, it is part of God's understanding that we're going to fall sometimes. We're going to make mistakes, and this is why he gave us grace. And so here's some you know, five key, five key ways to develop what we would call biblical conviction through prayer, through a discipline of being in God's word, through calling out to him and asking him for understanding, uh, by storing up his word in our hearts, and by leaving room for him to uh, enact grace for us. At the, um, 
middle part of Bridges' work here, page 164, uh, the second to last paragraph, he says, we should not think of the concept of continually, in other words, um, striving continually to consider God's will and his way and apply that to our convictions. We should not think of the concept of continually as meaning every single moment. Rather, we should think in terms of consistently and habitually. What does your mind turn to when it's free to turn to anything? Do you begin to meditate on scripture? I often ask people this question. When you can think about anything, what do you want to think about? Um, I'll leave you with this thought then. When it comes to our moral conviction, our biblical convictions, we need to make biblical convictions our habit. We have to make a habit of meditating on God's word, applying God's word to our lives, and living God's word out in our lives. When we will make a habit of those things, then when the moment comes where we have to make a snap decision about um, how we're going to uh, how we're going to feel about something, how we're going to um, think towards something, if we're going to, if we're going to uh, um, participate in that thing, if we're going to whatever, when we have to make those quick judgments, if we have made a habit of meditating on God's Word, applying it to our lives, and living it out each and every day, then we can be pretty well assured we're, you know, more times than not, we're going to make a, a decision that is based in biblical convictions. And so I encourage you with that this week. Um, look forward to meeting together with you again next week as we uh, turn the page into chapter 11 of Bridges' book. Um, and we're, we're getting, you know, more than halfway through this book now. Um, and it's just been a great joy for me to join together with you. So I'll see you again next week. I hope you have a great week.